David, we're here. It's a beautiful southern afternoon. The wind is, the breeze is blowing. Uh, we got a nice sun here. We're in the same city. I'm actually right here in person for once, which is fun. Right, exactly. We're sitting across from each other. Um, and this is, this is a bonus episode because we were going to record a, an entire episode like normal, but I kind of dropped the ball. On that, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't just you, Daniel. It was a, a team effort of ball dropping. So, so basically, what happened is, you know, I had I had this big wedding this weekend. Listen to this beautiful soundscape. Bernie Kraus would be very angry right now. The, well, see, this is the thing about my neck of the woods here is, um, and I noticed this when I was doing that soundscape recording in the park in my neighborhood. Is there's never a moment where you don't hear an airplane. That low rumble of, uh, of an airplane. It's the same, same in New York, but at least you have like this nice wind chime here and the breeze and the birds. Yeah, we said, why not just sit outside? I mean, uh, screw it, right? Um, but the reason why this show kind of derailed is so I had this big wedding the past weekend that I was in uh, for my roommates. Um, you came down to Atlanta, you were busy. And I had um, reached out to an author of a book that we were going to discuss for this episode. Uh, so I was busy. I spent the whole week reading this book, preparing questions, listening to interviews with this author, so I would be prepared. And we had agreed that we would talk at such and such time GMT, right? And I'm on Easter time, they're on, was it, Greenwich? London time, whatever yeah. whatever that is. England time, UK time. So I just kept Googling, you know, what time is it in GMT right now, right? So I was, you know, that told me what time it was. So I woke up yesterday morning, uh, sat down with my cup of coffee after reviewing my notes, opened up Skype. Bright and early. Bright and early. And uh, looked at, I saw we had an email from this author saying, hey, I've been waiting for you and uh, I've got to go now. And I was like, I Googled, what, wait, what time is it in GMT? I said, I'm on schedule. So then I said, you know what, let me Google what time is it in England right now. And England was GMT plus one. Oof. Yeah. So, sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, this episode was really going to be built around that interview. Um, and we will get to it eventually, but... Uh, in the well, meantime, this is what we have. And you, initially, I was thinking we could power through, still do the episode. But the author said, you know, maybe I would be available this morning to talk. So I woke up this morning at 3 a.m. Um, just in case they would be available. I waited at my computer for two, two and a half hours. Um, and it just didn't work out. So I was a little sleep, sleep deprived. Um, that's my fault. I'm a little unprepared. Sorry. That's my fault. So um, we're going to push that back a week and instead maybe just talk about what's going on, state of the podcast kind of thing, keep it short, and let you all get about your day. And I, I want to also, before we do close out, bring up one thing that's happening right now that I think is really important that we'll get to in more depth in the future, but uh, we'll close out with that. Yes. Okay, first thing, um, we reached out to the listeners, everybody, uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago or so, uh, asking for some help with our transcripts, which we still need help with. We need people to help us transcribe uh, the backlog of transcripts and potentially going forward. But I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who has contributed to that. Uh, we have Maggie, Jan Dunn, Alexi, Nick, Morgan, Allfall, Andrew, Sudo McCoy, and Michael, thank you so much for helping us so far and, and for continuing to help us. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Yeah, these transcripts are a huge amount of work, but we really do think they're valuable, both for allowing people to search through the show, for people who speak other languages who need to translate stuff, and also for hearing impaired listeners. Uh, next up on the agenda, we have launched the Ashes Ashes Swag Store. 
Isn't that right, David? <laughs> yes, this is very exciting. Uh, there's not much on it right now. Admittedly, there's a couple of stickers that we've sent out to our Patreon subscribers. Uh, you can now find them on the store. There's a link at the top of the website where it says shop, or you can go to ashesashes.org slash shop. And you can buy these stickers uh, in packs of two. They're fun designs. We will be adding more stuff to it periodically. Um, this is not something we're putting a ton of time into, but it's nice to be able to have uh, things out there with our name on it. If you want to show some support to the show, we do appreciate it. Also, you know, supporting or just getting other uh, artists involved. That's my favorite part. Yeah, we do. Each one of these stickers going forward are designed by different artists. We pay the artists up front a flat fee for the design, but then we also take a portion of the sale of each sticker and send that back to the artist. So... And if you go in the shop right now, you're going to see three stickers. Um, but we actually have a couple more that have been designed, and we just got to, you know, we just have to get them printed and in our inventory, so to speak, so that uh, we can put that up on the store. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, it, and it is May 1st when we're recording this, so. Uh, happy soon. May Day, everyone. Happy May Day. Also, since it's the beginning of the month, I'm going to send out another batch of stickers to our Patreon collector uh, supporters. You'll be getting the Season 2 sticker in the mail. For those of you, actually, the, so the way I do it, David, is... It's very complicated. Right. I have this elaborate Excel sheet. I track all the Patreon supporters. And when you sign up as a collector, you'll until we get more stickers, you're going to be getting a sticker like every other month. We start with the basic one, the, the original uh, Ashes Ashes design, and then every you know when you get the next sticker, you're basically going to be getting the next design. So it kind of goes down. You basically get to collect them as they came out. Um, maybe I'll I'll do it differently in the future. I don't know. We'll see. Collect them all. That's what I say. Gotta catch them all. Uh, sp- speaking of art, speaking of uh, engaging the community. We have an idea, David, this is really your idea, and I've kind of inserted myself into it, but this uh, collaborative art project where we hope uh, maybe we can do something special to kind of expose some of the uh, insidious technologies that we talk about on this show. Um, And we're looking for someone to help us with technical experience, um, specifically in the realm of facial tracking, uh, public cameras. I don't want to give too much away here. but <laughs> You're giving a lot away. Uh, a lot of this is down the line a little bit. We have to do some back-end stuff before we're ready for that part, but at some point we will need a couple people or one talented person who does have some experience with facial recognition, camera vision stuff. Um, if this is something that sounds interesting to you and you want to do something to expose just how uh, insidious all this technology can be, uh, send us an email, contact at ashesashes.org. Uh, it's going to be a little bit until we need your help, but uh, please reach out now. We can walk you through some of the basic things we're thinking, and you can tell us, uh, yeah, that sounds doable, or you two are insane, this is impossible, sorry. Right, that's really what I want to find out. Um, uh, also, on the vein of community, join our Discord. You can go to our website, ashesashes.org, find the Link at the top of the banner for our Discord channel. Join that uh, so you can be a part of all the discussion there. And we're looking for people who might be interested in helping us with social media. Uh, We have a method for handing over some of the keys to that. And uh, Yeah, particularly our Twitter account. Uh, For those of us who don't follow us on social media, we sort of have this divided uh, setup right now where the Instagram is just... Instagram is, is the meme page. Uh, Twitter just vomits out bad news continuously all day. Mm-hmm. Um, and Facebook mirrors the Twitter because I don't want to work on that. So we're sort of interested in taking our Twitter and making it more interactive, retweeting people, taking what little audience we have and being able to utilize it for something useful. Uh, and we want to hand the keys over to individuals you know, once a week. Uh, for you to run our Twitter for a week and say what you want and, and interact with the community how you feel best fit and then pass it on to someone else. Yeah, I'm curious to see how it would go. So if you're interested in that or being oh, part yeah. of this... That's why I mentioned Discord. Just yeah. join the Discord. Join the Discord. Let's create like a channel specifically for social media. I'll, I'll set one up. It'll be the social media channel. Come um, 
hang out in there, send us a message, and uh, we can get that cranking. Okay, so with all that out of the way, what's going on in the world today, David? Um, what can we mention so that we uh, haven't wasted everybody's time completely? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, as always, going on right now that's uh, most of it isn't great. But I want to point our attention to this report that's about to come out that's very important. And, and when we talk on this show about reports, it's almost always the IPCC report, uh, that big climate change policy piece of paper that told us the state that we're in, what we need to do if we want to stay under 2 degrees Celsius or hit 1.5. Uh, we've analyzed that report in depth in the past. But uh, there's a second report, actually, that's maybe just as important, if not more important, than the IPCC uh, and it's the IPBES General Assessment. And IPBES is an intergovernmental uh, science organization with 130 member states. It stands for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is a mm -hmm. mouthful. So IPBES. Um, and the last big one of these reports they ran out was in 2005. And these reports are called the General Assessments. And it just sort of looks at the state of all life on Earth and says, well, how's it doing? Where are the problems? What is endangered? Uh, where are we influencing things in a negative way? How can we turn that around and bring things back in a positive way? Just like we do with the climate with the IPCC report. Uh, it's a huge piece of work with thousands of scientists and researchers and diplomats and politicians, for better or for worse, putting all this time and effort into it uh, to make both not only a state of the world, so to speak, but also policy recommendations, uh, treaties for these member states to join and try and follow in order to save the environment and ecosystem around us. Well, right now, starting a couple days ago and going until May 4th, uh, the final edit of this paper is occurring, and we are, on May 6th, going to see the release of the first IPBES general assessment since 2005. And uh, there has already been a leak of this paper that came out in a French news agency called AFP. Uh, and apparently the state is not so good, Daniel. There are over a million species right now that are facing near-term extinction in the next few decades uh, that are potentially endangered at the moment. Uh, We've talked in the past about this ecosystem collapse that's going on around us. Uh, it's terrible in the ocean. It's terrible on land. It's putting a lot of our agriculture at threat. This report, which you probably never heard of, is probably going to be more important and more... Well, it will affect... Well, see, this is the interesting thing. When you say it's, it's more uh, important than climate change or, or more impactful... I mean, everything is interconnected, right? Uh, ecosystems collapse because of climate change, but also climate change is accelerated by things like ecosystems collapse. But what is our day-to-day -day really impacted? Like, what is modern civilization interacting with the most? And I think when it comes to climate change, we look at carbon dioxide parts per uh, million in the atmosphere as like a, as a, a signal of how climate change is progressing and how this greenhouse gas effect might impact all these interconnected systems. But in terms of how we, how we feel that and how we are affected by that, what you're saying, I think, is, is how these ecosystems collapsing and the services we derive from them are really the, the foundation of modern life. Um, and we are worried about climate change in so much as it affects those things, right? Ocean acidification is a problem because that's where our fisheries are located. It's where so much of the services that we rely on as a human civilization, whether that's filtering, pollution, or whatnot, um, that's, that's what we depend on. And so, yeah, I'm really interested to dig into this report and see what some of the implications are and really looking at how the, the changing ecosystems around the world are going to impact our day-to-day necessities, the way we live, our agricultural food systems, um, things that we might not think about. Put much more eloquently than I was, Daniel. That's exactly right. And this report is so incredibly important. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be hundreds of pages long. Uh, if you want to get a jump on this, it comes out May 6th. You can start reading it then. Um, but I, I just want to read a couple things that they mentioned on their website that, that goes sort of uh, over what this report is about. So it covers all land-based ecosystems except for Antarctica, 
as well as inland water and open ocean ecosystems. It evaluates the change over the past 50 years, and this is what's important, the implications for our economies, livelihoods, food security, and our quality of life. And this is a big sort of shift in the way that we viewed environmentalism over the past few decades. It's not so much anymore about saving an individual panda or saving a rainforest. It's about, well, how do we need to protect these ecosystems in order to protect the way that we live our lives? And this report is really centered around that concept. Mm -hmm. It ranks the relative impacts of climate change, invasive species, pollution, sea and land use change, and a range of other challenges to nature. It explores impacts of trade and other global processes on biodiversity and ecosystem services, which is something that, Daniel, I know you really are interested in, that ecosystem service stuff. Um, Identifies priority gaps in our available knowledge that will need to be filled and projects what biodiversity could look like in decades ahead under six future scenarios. Economic optimism, regional competition, global sustainability, business as usual, regional sustainability, and reformed markets. And after it goes through all of this, finally, it assesses policy, technology, governance, behavior changes, uh, options and pathways to reach global goals by looking at synergies and trade-offs between food production, water security, energy and infrastructure expansion, climate change mitigation, nature conservation, and economic development. So this is the part that is being really written right now as we speak, literally, Daniel, by these these diplomats, these policymakers, these business owners who have come in to sort of shape the final recommendation part of this paper. But but the stuff that we really want to take away with it, the impacts that are happening around the world, what it means for our future, that stuff is done. And that stuff we can start digging into May 6th. And uh, we will absolutely at some point devote a show entirely to this report and the concepts and ideas that it carries out and what that means for all of us uh, whenever we get around to reading those hundreds of pages. Hell yeah. I thought it was interesting. So you came down and we took a walk in my neighborhood, went to the park, and you were showing me this app uh, called... PlantNet. Yeah, PlantNet. So basically you can take a photo of a plant and then it it uses the machine learning from this, you you know, developed by this university to match that species. You can uh, confirm that and then log, you know, what you've seen. Uh, location and everything. Yeah, it's it's crowdsourced computer vision for identifying plants. So you take a picture of a leaf or fruit or bark or the entire plant, it uploads into the server, it compares it against the corpus of data they have. Uh, it says, oh, this seems to match, you know, this particular type of berry plant. And it shows you a bunch of pictures and a bunch of options and says, are any of these right? And you hit confirm or reject. And then in that process, you both get the identification of that plant, and then their data set gets a little bit better, so they get better at identifying stuff in the future. Yeah, and so uh, in the context of what you are talking about, it reminded me, um, it was just funny to me, like, now that we have this amazing machine learning algorithms at our fingertips, we can finally use, use the uh, assistance of computers, uh, crowdsourcing, and, and the internet to log species after you know 99 percent of them have been wiped out but you know crowdsourcing is really important we talked about you know that big uh, german study that came out what was it 2017 that mm-hmm. kind of shook the world in terms of ecosystem collapse about all the insects that are dying off that was crowdsourced and i think i've been seeing a little bit more of that i'm looking into volunteering and uh in, in land conservation where i'm moving to massachusetts and a lot of the roles involve leading uh, citizen uh, research, you know, how can we use people, uh, citizens in our community to help really track uh, the state of these ecosystems, track what species are still around, how they're doing. I think that's going to be important going forward. Yeah. Uh, anytime we can get people involved in analyzing the world around them, I think we're better off because then everybody has a better understanding of their impacts on that world. It also puts science back, you know, and the legitimacy of science back in the hands of ordinary people. That, that's one one thing I wanted to talk about with that author that we were going to interview is um, about the legitimacy of um, like uh, funded research initiatives, like let's say military funded uh, research on you know the effects of some weapon that we've developed uh, versus the type of uh, data we can get from people on the ground that are witnessing things and observing things. And it turns out a lot of times, sometimes we get better better data uh, 
in, from these kind of decentral uh, mm -hmm. initiatives, but because we live in this very, you know, uh, institutional world where everything has been kind of siloed off into institutions, we sometimes don't respect that which doesn't come from some quote unquote legitimate source. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the data can be great, but it was collected by just dedicated researchers who aren't uh, members of an institution. They might not have PhDs, so people, for whatever reason now, want to throw that away. And uh, the trappings of legitimacy only come when there's an academy after somebody's name. And that's, I don't know how we ended up in this way, and we're going to talk about the academic institutions and, and what science and research has uh sort of evolved into over the past few decades at some point in, in a lot of depth because it's a very messed up institution. Um, but it, it's sort of sad and because citizen science is fun. It's exciting. It's a great way to get involved in all this stuff. And like you said, a lot of times you get better data that way. Yeah. So um, something to think about. I think we've rambled enough here. Uh, anything else we should mention? Okay. I promise. I promise I will be better about coordinating interviews in the future. I will, uh, I will no longer Google what time is GMT. I will just find out where someone lives. I will Google what time it is in their city, right? I'll put that world clock on my phone. Now, I'm going to just buy you 24 clocks, <laughs> and you can have one for <laughs> yeah, every have, time zone. <laughs> yeah, let me have 24 clocks in my room. Yeah, perfect. Cuckoo clocks. All right. Uh, we're closing out now. <laughs> Thanks for uh, tuning in to this bonus, not an episode, episode. Uh, until next week, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.